All right, so uh, welcome folks. I see uh, we have some early arrivals, glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking cooperative design and systems thinking and progressive gaming mechanics with Mike Sellers. So uh, Scott, before you go, can you turn off your video, please? Thank yeah. you. All right, got, uh, so Nahal, Wolfgang, uh, Jaz Winder, please say hello in the chat and tell us where you're from. We'd love to hear from you. All right, so Mike, let's start by connecting cooperative design to what we're seeing all around us today in our world. Oh my goodness, that's a, uh... A large and a question, but but a great place to start. I'm going to take off my glasses so you don't get the glare from my my okay. many monitors right around me. Um, uh, you know, there uh, there's a few things I can I can point at in terms of cooperative design. Uh, I think of this in terms of uh, non-zero sum design and how we design for groups. And I think one of the easiest things is um, how people come together spontaneously. Uh, sometimes with with outside organization, but often often just spontaneously, uh, and we we can look at the peaceful protests that we're seeing, um, the autonomous zone in the Capitol Hill area of Seattle, um, and any number of things like this. But right down to uh, every time we have a natural disaster, a hurricane, or something like that, we see people rush in and help out, um, and that's a that's a great example. It, I mean, it starts off. It's a great example of cooperative design, and it starts off off often disorganized, but inevitably you get good organization coming out of it where people are able to do effective things. And as we're seeing, make effective change. Um, that stands in stark contrast to uh, zero sum design, I win, you lose, where I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that I and, and my team, those like me, win and everyone else, all those people that I consider to be outside of my, my circle, uh, my circle of empathy, if you will, lose. And that's, I think we, we can see very clearly how destructive that is. Uh, there's, and I can go on with that one, I guess one last thing I'll say for the, just as an opener is that the examples I gave of sort of grassroots bottom up uh, cooperative design don't mean that that's the only way it can happen. In fact, there is really uh, a tremendous amount of power that we can leverage in uh, terms of hierarchical social design uh, where you have, um, if you have a, a group that is uh, organized and oriented for good, say the Red Cross or something like that, they could do tremendous work, far more than they could do as individuals or as just a simple grassroots organization. And I think that's one of the sort of the deeper keys to cooperative design that I hope we have time to get into. Absolutely. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Do you see that? Yep, yep. So let's talk about rule number one because it's really what you're talking about. It's the heart of what you're talking about, which is banding together to accomplish something you couldn't accomplish on your own. And it doesn't mean there's not competition. It means that you're competing against a system or an other. Part of why in political discourse, pointing a finger at the other works so well is because it makes people band together right, around exactly. something larger than themselves. It can be used negatively. But it's also, you know, if you think about the movie The Martian, uh, which I love, it came out of the book, but that story is, you know, PVE. <laughs> it's, uh, and we're gonna get into that in a moment with systems design, player versus environment. Everybody, all the people in, are banding together to get him home. And who's the enemy? Just the harsh environment, just the situation. And right now, the protests are against an unfair system. It's people banding together to compete with the system and try and win. So how does that connect for you, Mike? I think you've, you've really hit on something important. Um, I really think the, 
the, it, anytime, well, we, sorry, let me try it again. Anytime we find that, that we can give people an opportunity to band together and to lend their strengths to something larger than themselves, we all find that really compelling. And this goes right back to Maslow. It's a, it's a taste of self-actualization of, I'm gonna contribute to a group that I find to be worthwhile and really important. And that doesn't be something political. It could be certainly could be something commercial, um, you know, political, religious, familial, any of those things. Um, but I think one of the interesting things we have in terms, the interesting opportunities we have in terms of product design, games certainly is where I mostly think about, but not just games, is that we have this opportunity to to intentionally structure situations where people can cooperate and can get that kind of value out of their cooperation. Um, I think taking a long view for just a moment, if I am um, making a product of whatever type, that's my job and that's my work and great. But if I feel good about myself at the end of the day, if I feel like I've helped my team at the end of the day, then I'm going to be much more um, excited about coming back to work tomorrow and next week and next year and have that, that great sense of fulfillment that you have when you do anything that is personally meaningful to you. So I think one of the great ancillary benefits that we may overlook sometimes with cooperative design is not just in the moment, but over the long haul, that we really do have this, this feeling of meaning that we derive from, from cooperative efforts. Uh, and, and yeah, sometimes that does mean, often that does mean that there is an external other that we're pushing back against, whether it's a system or another group or something. Um, but I think even in cases where there, that other is a little more diffuse, um, you know, rather than say Mars actively trying to kill you, uh, that there's a lot we can get out of, out of cooperative design. Yeah, and that really reminds me of one of the examples you often use for systems design, which is birds flocking. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure they're exactly competing against a system, but they're, they're trying to accomplish a shared goal. Yeah, and, and this is a, a fascinating one in that it's it's three very easy to understand rules that that add up to something much bigger than themselves. This is a great example of emergence where you get a, a wonderful flock of birds out of this. Another great example that I love is uh, fireflies blinking synchronously, where there's they have to follow just one rule to get everyone firing at the same time. You can look at that as as a group effort. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of of uh, things like this that um, where we can see these kind of shared efforts, even if there isn't a definable system, um, or in some cases, even not, not a predefined goal. I think in any sort of group uh, or product design, we are looking at, at some kind of defined goal. We have something we're trying to accomplish. Um, now, for some groups that might be, let's improve everyone's lives. Everyone in the group, let's improve their lives. If this is a a, uh, a you know an intentional community or a, a group help self-help, um, self-help group, uh, we might say really our goal is to help this group become better. Or if it's a, a university class, you might say one of the goals here is that everyone understands uh, the, the material better. And, and so in my teaching, in fact, it's not just the material, but it's let's make sure everyone in, in this group knows how to operate as part of a group better. And I think that's often uh, one of the goals that management has as well. Um, so it doesn't have to be a, a defined system we're pushing back against. I think that there's uh, really simple things like with birds flocking that we can do that get to um, important, meaningful, shared goals that we may all have. Yeah. And on that note, you had an interesting experience with cooperation and shared goals and shared resources regarding the um, recent protests and peaceful marches, which, by the way, are a great example of emergence. Very much so. I'm, so I, tell us that story about how you participated. So um, we wanted to be supportive of um, the, the uh, very peaceful uh, protests going on in my town and to be part of something larger. Again, I think that's a, that's a desire that we all have. And yet we uh, in my family have some health concerns that um, made it not tenable for us to do so. So as a family, we talked about it and said, what can we do? And we decided that what we could do was to buy some water and some supplies and take them down there, uh, take them down to where the, the people were, were gathered together. Um, and then my wife also has made a bunch of masks uh, for, for, uh, that we've been uh, giving out to, to different people in different groups. Um, and so we took a bunch of those with us too and handed them out to some people who didn't have them. So 
even though we weren't able to be part, a direct part of the of this uh, the the demonstration, we were able to feel like we were you know having an, a positive effect and and lending our resources to it, which again I think is a is a really big deal uh, in terms of like the slide here says shared resources. Uh, we were able to take our resources and devote them to the group's good rather than just to our own good. And this is such a useful concept to add to understanding what cooperative systems are and how you can build them, which is you, you know, competing against the system, very motivating, brings people together because they can't do it by themselves. You need other people. And there's many ways to participate. One of the most powerful is to think in terms, as you said, of shared outcomes. We share the outcome. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Well, we can share resources. And you went down and you shared water and you shared masks. And that's, that's a cooperative gesture. I think it's significant too, not that I thought of this in that moment, but that um, I as an individual wasn't just sharing it with another individual. We, we have done that and we'll continue to do so. Um, but sharing my resources with the group as a whole, I think is a really important point. And that could be, uh, again, like in a game sense, that could be I have you know, so much gold or so much wood, but it could also be, I have this kind of skill and I'm willing to give this skill to the group. And I think there are strong analogies for that in all kinds of product design, that, that um, notion of I am here at this level as an individual and the group is at this level. So I'm a bird and the flock is up here, or I'm an individual and the, the overall protest is up here. I'm going to devote something from myself up to this level, I think is a really, really important point about cooperative design. And that brings up one of the next core principles, which is interdependent roles. Right. We don't all have to give the same, play the same role. Anyone who's ever played an RPG knows about the joy of interdependent roles. And every team has interdependent roles. People don't play the same role. Um, so your engagement with the protest was an example, not just of shared resources, but interdependent roles. Exactly. I think this is a really, um, it seems kind of obvious because we all know about it. We've all been on teams with interdependent roles. And that's something that I think we, we often neglect in our own lives and in, in, in our own design roles. Um, one of the things that I've read about, and I'm sure you know about Amy, uh, it is about um, the development of how children play, where they play alone and they play side by side and they play with, they begin to, be, to play with other, other children. And we, this is where we see these interdependent roles coming out. And I think in terms of any kind of design that we're doing, uh, it's really important to say, um, not only do I have roles, I have strengths that you don't have and I have resources you don't have, but that there are things that we can do together that none of us can do alone or that we can do them better together. Um, one of my students designed a, a multiplayer game. It was a, a loosely about, about farming. And one of the great things they found was that just by having a small nonlinear increase. So if I can plant, um, you know, 10 plants a minute or whatever it is, and you can do 10 plants a minute on your own, but together we can do just a little bit better. So instead of doing 20 uh, by combining our roots, maybe we do 22. So just a, just a small increase. That alone is enough to incentivize people to, um, to come together. And of course, if you then throw in actual inter interdependent roles where you can plant faster and I can water faster and together we can do it even, even faster than we could individually, that starts people on this virtuous cycle uh, of, of a, a reinforcing loop where they will uh, continue to work together and to use their roles and their resources uh, as a comp in a complementary, complementary fashion. And then what happens is our our uh, psychology and our neurology takes over. And we say, that's terrific. I love that. It's meaningful to me. I will continue to do that. But we have to kind of nudge that into place by giving people in any kind of design situation, by giving people that, that feedback and that reward saying, oh, this is a good thing. And look, you're doing better than you would have on your own, which again is an experience we've all had anytime we've been in a, a band or a team or anything else. How does that play out in your own work with your students and with your department? We do two primary things, really. If you think of this in sort of big piles, we teach a lot about systems thinking and game design and you know all of the things that are sort of in that realm of, here's a bunch of technical and theoretical knowledge and, and practical knowledge too. 
And then the other big thing that we do, and we're very overt in, in talking to our students about this, is we talk about being a member of a team. It's easy to sit around a table with people and say, hey, we're a team. It's a lot harder when it's six months or nine months on and you're kind of tired of these people and you're kind of tired of, you know, this one foible this person has or how they say they'll do this and they don't really or, or whatever it is. Being part of a team is a very hard thing. Being part of a team that actually gets something done is a very hard thing. So the second big pile of, of things that we teach our students is how to work in teams with people who think differently than they do who have different skills and, and different strengths than they do and who talk differently. And this, of course, pools out very quickly, not just from, you know, to program an artist who may not speak quite the same to, oh, you have a different life history than I do. You come from a very small town in Indiana and you're the first person in your family to, to ever go to university where someone else on the team is a young person of color who is maybe evaluating their sexuality and isn't quite sure what to do with that about that. We see all different kinds of, of dimensions like this. And when it works well, it is uh, honestly one of the great joys of my, of my job and my work is to see students who are very different come together and form something larger than themselves and really create this emergent whole um, be, you know, of, of their team and eventually of the, of the product they create. Absolutely. So... One of the great joys of my life is getting to learn from you <laughs> and collaborate with you. We are longtime collaborators, and I'm very excited about the collaboration we're doing now, which is system design fundamentals that unlocks the secrets of system design for product designers everywhere. And we're going to be doing a workshop on this coming up in our innovation boot camp, summer innovation boot camp, which launches next week. I wanted to just give a really quick overview of that workshop and um, talk about the questions that we're going to answer briefly uh, with some systems diagrams. So get ready, folks. Here comes some <laughs> system diagrams. Be still my heart. Uh, this is not the whole thing, but for everybody who's interested in the link between cooperation and systems design, and for everybody who believes we need more systems thinking overall in our world, so we're not so susceptible to manipulative, simple answers and inflammatory messages, let's talk systems. So first of all, one of the first question we're gonna answer in this workshop is what is a system? what's not a system. And we used the flocking example, which is great. It's got these three rules. Now, there's another example that's really familiar, which is a thermostat. And this is from your book, this uh, chart. So Mike, talk to us about the thermostat example and why it's so useful for really thinking in systems. Right. So the, the, the big thing you see here at a, at a high level is this loop. And this is something that is common to all systems. They aren't linear. They're always looping. Something affects something else, which goes back and affects the first thing. So in this case, it's a really simple example. If I say I want it to be cooler on a hot day like today where I am, uh, I might, uh, or I guess we have heat applied here, so I'll go the other way. It's a cold day. I want to uh, turn my thermostat up. Uh, so I say there's a gap where I want where I want it is not where it is. So I want it to be warmer, so we apply heat. So the bigger the gap, the the more heat we're going to apply. That's the plus in that diagram. And the more heat that applies, the smaller that gap is. And so as that gap gets smaller, the plus on the top, the heat that's applied gets smaller. So you see the second part of this diagram where over time we approach the desired temperature. And as we do, we, we, we reduce and reduce and reduce the amount of heat that we're applying. So this is an example of what's called a balancing loop, sometimes called a negative feedback loop, but that terminology is a little bit misleading. But the idea that one balances out the other, we have a gap and then we apply heat. And as these two come into balance, they, they, they reach a state of equilibrium or, or homeostasis, depending on the case. Right. So flocking is a system. Right. Thermostats is a system. The, um, we're going to get into the parts and holes. Systems are parts in relation to each other. 
that's fundamentally what makes it a system. And we touched on this, but let's go a little deeper. Why is it so important to understand systems in today's world? One of the things about the world we live in today is that we are far more interconnected. This is almost cliche at this point, but we are far more interconnected than any time in human history before this. So really up until the mid 1980s, we were only sort of locally connected. I, I would, you know, I have uh, reciprocal relationships with people in my town and my family and things like that, but likely not with someone on another continent. And, and as uh, our interconnection, our technological interconnections have grown from having roughly a thousand interconnected devices in mid 1980s to, I believe the latest number I saw was 50 billion. So a multiple of the number of people on the planet interconnected devices means that we are all far more inter interconnected. We have 24 hour news. I um, was able to eat grapes today that came from Chile and, and a, a pear from South Africa. Everything in our lives is, is interconnected. Um, what this means is that we have to be aware of the systems that are operating around us and sometimes on us so that we can understand things like the financial crisis in uh, 2008. How did that happen? There's a, a, a very a definable system we can look at or a pandemic, how that spreads. In December, January, there were a lot of people saying, oh, this isn't something you need to worry about. February, a few people started getting more worried. And those people who understood how systems work and how viruses spread as a system were very worried and rightfully so. Uh, and likewise, today we have people saying, okay, well, that, was, that wasn't great, but at least we're past it. No, we're really not past it at all. And we need to understand that as a system. If you understand how systems work in our lives, then we can understand the systems we're part of and how our response to those systems can either uh, reinforce them or, or uh, you know, abate them. So if I go and deliver water to a bunch of people protesting, that may seem like a small thing, but you know what, I'm helping somebody else out and I am reinforcing that system. It's gonna go on further. If I call out misinformation, when I see it online, say, hey, that thing you just said, that's not really correct. And here's something that, here's a good source that corrects it. I'm tamping down the spread of misinformation. And if I understand it from a systems point of view, I understand that really it doesn't require everyone to bring water or everyone to tamp down misinformation, but some of us have to do, some, you know, some of us have to do it. It's, it's um, as a friend of mine once said, it's not necessary that everyone do everything, but everyone needs to do something. And that it's much easier to understand the kinds of things we, we can be watching for and doing in our lives and in our work. And just in terms of, again, in terms of product design, if we understand the systems that are operating there. That's so, so true. And, you know, that really leads us into our next question that we're going to address in the workshop, which is, how do the parts and loops and holes, the things that we're talking about, how do they create systems? Because to understand systems, you have to know just a few core ideas. You know, I have to say, I'm thinking about a video I saw this morning of a hearing in Orange County somewhere where people were just incensed about masks and they were getting up there and saying, it's a hoax, this is ridiculous, our civil rights, there's nothing to worry about when, you know, all the numbers tell us, you know, 100,000 people dead in our country. It's like, we really need more systems thinking. It's, right. um, you know, and there's a lot of different ways to attack it, but we're attacking it in our way. So let's talk about parts, loops, and holes. So this is really the, the, as you said, a moment ago, there's not a lot of concepts we need to understand, and there's a lot more detail we can go into, of course, but the core of it really is that you have individual parts, individual things. A bird in a flock is a part. The flock itself is the whole. And in between there are the loops in terms of how two birds or two things interact with each other. This is a great diagram of uh, predator and prey. So you have lynxes and hares, where uh, in this case we have... Uh, lynxes decrease the number of hairs, not surprisingly. And if the lynxes are able to eat, then they presumably they're also able to reproduce, and so you get more lynxes. Meanwhile, the hairs in this in this model are just, you know, reinforcing themselves. They they are growing on their own. But what you what you don't see with this is any sort of linear increase in lynxes or here, hairs. What you see is instead of an oscillating increase and decrease. Because if lynxes eat too many hairs, 
and the hairs aren't able to reproduce, then the lynxes aren't able to reproduce either, and their population crashes. And so we see this kind of thing uh, quite often um, in, in, in biological and in some, in some social systems. Um, well, that's the, interdependence. Exactly. So the lynx and the, the hair. So the parts here are the lynxes and the hairs. The, the, the loops are, as you can see, the, the hairs have a self-reinforcing loop and the lynxes and the hairs have a, a balancing loop. And the hole that you have here is an ecology or a biosphere. And we can look at this on all different kinds of levels. And I won't go into it right now, but we can look at this on everything from a subatomic level to everything, uh, how, what, what is a country or what is a company? That, that's a whole that's made out of individual parts that interact together. Or one more, I think, pretty clear example is like a game of chess where the individual pieces in, in, on the chessboard are the parts. They have defined moves that's, that's, that, and they, they form loops in how they work together. And the whole is the chess game itself. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now so we don't, we don't get into too deep water at this point. Oh, this is a great one. This is really one of my favorites. There is a, a wonderful video called How Wolves Change Rivers that talks about how the introduction of a very few wolves in the mid-1990s into Yellowstone Park actually ended up changing the course of rivers in, in Yellowstone. And the way it happened was that the wolves, the first order effect is that the wolves eat deer. Everyone kind of gets that. You might think, well, it stops there, but it really doesn't because there are all these other looping effects where the the deer uh, because they they aren't there aren't so many of them and they retreat up into the highlands they aren't eaten so easily by wolves so they stop eating the low lying trees and grass that allows more birds to to appear which makes the, the trees and grass grow even more it allows more um, fish to, to to lie in the hollows in in the stream and allows more bears to eat the fish and the deer and the elk which further decreases their numbers the additive relationship of all of that is that the um, the trees and the grass growing uh, helps stabilize the banks of the rivers, which again helps other things like you know beavers come in and and engineer their environment. But that reduces erosion and meandering, makes the water clearer, which also helps more fish appear. So you have multiple cycles, even more than are actually shown in this diagram here. Multiple loops happening uh, that, that are all part of this ecological system. I guess we'll just one more since we have just a second here. Um, the hole is really important to understand here too in that, and the easiest hole for us to understand is the hole that we experience. So um, I am part of a group at my, at, at my university and I'm part of my university overall, I'm part of my community. My experience of the whole of my community or my university or my group depends on all the looping interactions that we have there. And I re referring back to the chess game, um, if Amy, Joe, and I play a game of chess together, the game is what happens on the board, theoretically. But really, the experience of that, the whole of that, is the experience that, that we have together as people playing a game. And this takes us right back to cooperative design, where anytime you have a team operating together in a game or in a product setting, the experience they have is the whole of the system that you're really trying to create. Right. And... I think for a lot of us who are creators, you know, we create, oops, we create projects. We create, you know, apps, games, services, marketplaces, uh, physical products, movements, <laughs> and you know, events, all those things. But um, for those of us who create digital products, there is this uh, experience that players have of your product, your game, your service. And the whole is from the moment they hear about it till their last touch with it. That's right. the whole, right? That the journey over time, which we'll get to in a moment. But you've got this great diagram in your book, your amazing book, which we'll link in the comments, by the way, that about the player feedback loop. And there's a lot that builds on this core loop. But this picture has parts, holes, and a loop. So make that connection for us. Sure. So what we have here is a, a, a fairly typical player in game or player in your user and product situation where the player in this case has the um, inside them their intent. 
or what is it they're trying to do? And they're going to embody that intent and, and use it as input into the game. The game then does something, and that's the little looping diagram inside the game to change its internal state and provides feedback to the player to say, here's how things have changed, which then sets off the process again. The player says, oh, okay, so you made that move. Now I have these intents going on in my head. I want to do something new. I'm going to provide input into the, to the game again. This is in, in one diagram how a game is played or how, how a product is used, uh, where both the game and the player have internal state going on and systems within them. This then is the designer loop. And, and this is um, uh, something that I found, the first time I sketched this out, it, it, it was a, like, it cleared away a lot of fog for me because what I'm doing as a designer is I'm looking at the player and the game as a system on its own. And I'm inputting game design into it, that's my intent, and seeing how the, the player and game system itself changes, the feedback I get from the players, they say, I don't understand what's going on, or I really love that part. Um, and that's how I say, okay, that's, that one's good, that one's not so good, I need to change that. And that, of course, goes into, into my head. Um, there's a, in, in some ways, there's even a higher level one where you have not just a single designer, but you have an entire team working on the game or the product. And that takes us again back into cooperative design on the team level. Uh, but that's a again a, a, a thing we can cover later on. Yeah, that that goes longer. But yeah. this leads us right into one of the things that us product designers struggle with, which is progression. Right. Right. Exactly. And how so, to think about it in loops instead of mechanics. Yes. Um, this is uh, again we have the same. The player has an intent, they do something, the game makes some internal changes and gives feedback to the player. But there's another thing that's going on here, riding along with that feedback, is that the player, their, their place in the game, their experience of the game, the things they know how to do is changing over time. And this is one of the ways that we keep people engaged, is by having them progress, get rewards. Uh, we all respond to, to various rewards from, you know, I cleared this level, or I got a badge, or I got a, you know, some, some gold in the game, whatever it is. It's not those things specifically, the badge, or the gold, or anything like that, that, that makes the difference. It's that I see that I am on a journey, that I'm, on, I'm progressing through this in a way that is meaningful to me, and that adds to my own intent so that I can do new things in the game. Right. And that leads us uh, very much into the next question that we're going to touch on in our workshop, which is how systems drive progression and mastery. Right. So one thing that I can just going back to or thinking about the, the, um, the player diagram, the, with the players forming intent, what's happening there is that the the players are creating their own mental model of what the game is about or what their tasks are in the game. And that mental model grows over time. And that's something, again, that we as, as humans respond well to. We like learning about new things and going, okay, I have this new piece of information and that confirms to my mental model. And then, oh, here's a new piece of information. And this is a way you can think of this in terms of playing a game to learning a product to education itself. If I get a new piece of information that adds onto my mental model and gives me new capabilities that I can do, that's phenomenally rewarding. It's very engaging and it, it feels meaningful. I learned something today. That's a very meaningful thing. So this is something that by, by looking at, at how our players use our games, or our, 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 our users use our products, we can say, are we rewarding them with a coherent mental model that they can grow over time? And that progression is, is mirrored in the internal mental model of the player. Uh, so that as I understand my tasks or the game or whatever it is better over time, I'll be able to do more over time. I feel a greater sense of mastery. I maybe feel a greater sense of connection with my teammates and everything you know, just feels better to me. It's, it's a great place to be. So exactly. That's why the mental model that you're forming in your players or your customer's head over time is so important. And a lot of what I run into helping people apply game thinking and game design versus throw mechanics at something is really grasping what that mental model is. And I think your picture that shows it's in the player's head, right? Right. That's the mental model. It's not like, who cares about what you and your team think? You have to build your product to be coherent around a mental model. Why? 
because no, whether it is or not, there's still a mental model getting built in your player's head. And this is something you mentioned is really important, which is it doesn't really matter what you and your team think. A, a common, uh, I would say, pervasive minefield that I, uh, you know, the, I've stepped on numerous times. Actually, this just happened to me in a game that I'm working on where you put a lot of time and effort and thought and heart into this thing that you're designing, a game or any, any other kind of product. And your mental model is very clear, but that doesn't mean your user's mental model is. And it can be kind of deflating when you say, here, try this thing. I've worked really hard on it. And someone says, hmm, I don't quite understand this. I don't, I don't know what it is you're trying to do. Um, that's a, a difficult moment for a designer or any, any kind of creative designer at all. Uh, but you have to take a step back and say, it's not about me. It's about what my, my, my target uh, user or player uh, is, is trying to say to me. And you know, how, I need to take that, that feedback as well. Um, so that's a, a difficult but important point, I think. That's the breakthrough moment. It can be, yeah, yeah. After you sit back from it and go, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I had an amazing experience this morning with exactly that. Um, one of my clients got some incredibly harsh feedback. And she went, she's very into both bioengineering and like energy healing, mm -hmm. and which is awesome. And so she did an energy healing session and realized that this incredibly harsh feedback was her breakthrough, leaned in, and it was very painful and hard, leaned into it, came to our coaching meeting and show like she had made like three months of progress in a week. <laughs> and I was blown away. And I was like, wow. That's true. So it can be, but it, it, you have to lean into the pain. I think that's what I've learned. And Certainly. I've also learned, you know, as I, when I really work with people, they hate me sometime during it because we're all leaning into the pain, but that's where you get the breakthroughs. And the pain comes from um, brutally honest feedback on your precious idea. Well, and that, this also goes to the, the difference in levels. If, if you know, I get some, some difficult feedback or diff feedback, I find this difficult to process if I can depersonalize it for me and say, hang on, this is really not about me. It's about this thing that I'm trying to do, that, uh, this thing that maybe we as a group are trying to do. That again is a, is a great uh, type of breakthrough because I can say, this isn't about me or about you or about our miscommunication or whatever. It's about how do we make this thing better? And that again is a, an important part of, of cooperative design. Um, I did want to go back really quickly. Something else you said, I think another really important point about that it's not about the mechanics. I mentioned before that you could have you know, you get in a game, you get some resources or you level up or you get a badge or something like that. Those are the sort of the external signifiers of, of, of what you, you've done in the game, but they aren't the, the progress itself. And I think that sometimes in product design, um, we get uh, caught up in this thing saying, oh, well, we'll give someone a badge when they get to this point. The badge is really not the point. It's, it's, what, it's feedback that tells the, the, the user you're doing a good job. But it is the process of doing that good job and learning the things and building their mental model that's so important. And really, the 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 badge is not unimportant. It's a it's an important part of sort of the ritual of of the progress, the progress, and the journey as you have here. Uh, but it's not it's not the thing. You can't say because I have a badge, I have a journey. You have to have the journey first and then the badge. Right. The badges light the way. Right. But right. a lot of times there's no journey. What what I find people do in practice is they get very involved in behavioral tracking and nudging with the, like, we can measure this, we can track this, we could reward this, which is again, it's kind of comes down to mechanics versus journey, but you know, there's a lot, sometimes it's like what you can do and it's honestly low hanging fruit. Um, but what I've learned, you know, which I think you share is that the journey, you know, you have these, um, there's discovery where you're like figuring out what it is, onboarding where you're learning the ropes. That's the beginning of every product. Right. And then there's this loop. And so much of what you teach your students with systems design is about loops. And this is also, this is systems design in a nutshell, but this loop is really about the difference between feedback and progress versus mechanics and nudges. Exactly right. And I think that um, sometimes we we look at the nudges and the mechanics, the badges, things like that. It's like the old analogy of I'm I'm looking for my car keys under the street light because that's where the light is, even though that's not where I lost them. Um, and I think we we forget the whole. Again, if you look at the 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 user's journey here as the whole of their experience, 
we want to support that journey. We want to support that whole. And yes, we're going to support it along the way with various kinds of mechanics and 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 some nudges, sure, badges, things like that. But we we have to remember which one is driving which. So if we're focused on the the journey and their development and the development of their mental model, uh, I think we're going to be in a much better place and and have sustained engagement over time, rather than just saying, oh well. Uh, you know, we told them they have to log in tomorrow, so we're done. That's just, that's really not going to work over time. Right. And uh, a lot of folks have already learned that. Maybe some of you listening. And by the way, questions are coming up soon. So think about what you'd like to ask Mike or me about systems, about cooperative design, about our upcoming summer boot camp. Uh, we'll, we'll post a links to that uh, in the chat as well. Scott, if you could do that, that'd be awesome. So the last question we're going to talk about in our workshop, which is, by the way, part of the summer boot camp, is, okay, this is great, right? It's great to understand these things. How can you actually analyze and understand the systems around you so you get some action from all of this, whoops, from all of this thinking? Yeah, this is a really important one and and hard one the, the principles themselves are not hard it's the doing of it that takes some some real effort and i think experience um the way that i go about this with my students is to have them take an existing phenomenon an ecology you know natural phenomenon or a game or something like that and to break it down so the first step is to do an analysis and to break it down and say what are the parts here that's a, the, one of the things you want to look for is what are the individual parts? And once we can, and, and sometimes you talk about this in terms of nouns and verbs. So, so what are the nouns in, um, in a game, for example? Then this is a, this is a really good example, um, where if I have a, a, a game about uh, a sh one ship fighting other ships, I, I can choose various ways I might wanna break that down if I'm designing it. But in this case, I, have, I know that I have a captain and I have crew and I have the ship and the ship has cannon. And then I can say, okay, how do these things interact? Say, oh, well, it looks to me like the captain affects the crew um, by in, in terms of affecting their morale. And the captain is able to hire different numbers of crew and to see, and how much time does the captain, time and money does the captain devote to training the crew? These are all different things that the captain can do as interactions. So each of these arrows is a verb. There's something that the captain can do or the player as the captain can do to say, I'm gonna spend money on hiring more crew, but that, as a result, I have less money for training them. So that's a decision that I, I as a player am, am making. And then the crew as a whole have some kind, of, some kind of fighting system that we're not even gonna look at here. All we know is that they do that. We could break that down separately. And then that I'm going to, um, the crew and, and the, the, the cannon the ship have are going to attack. So for example, I haven't maintained my cannon very well. They're not gonna attack very well. And then I have enemy ships that um, if we are able to you know, take them over or something, presumably we get more money and maybe my captain's leadership goes up because he did a good job. And so then uh, that then forms this loop where now I have more money and I have more leadership so I can act more effectively. Maybe I can hire more people than I could have before. There's a number of different, uh, different loops there or different, different aspects to that. But the, really the core of this is finding the nouns and then the, the individual objects, the pieces, the parts, and how do they interact with other things uh, that, are in, that are part of the system? The other piece of this is to understand the difference between a linear system and a looping system, or excuse me, a linear process and a looping system, where uh, one example is uh, if, I, if I launch a multi-stage rocket, what happens to the third stage is affected by the first stage, certainly, first and second stage, but it's not going to loop back and affect the first stage. That's a great example of a complicated linear, linear uh, process. And sometimes we have those, like if you're launching a rocket. On the other hand, most of the things that we, that we encounter are actually loops. And one of the hardest conceptual leaps that I find people have to make is to say, okay, so like here we have the lynxes and the hares again. I have the lynx, it eats a hare. And okay, now, now how does the, what, what happens then? Well, that's it, that's the end of it. It's like, no, no, that's not the end of it all. Because this lynx has survived a little bit longer because it ate a hare, now it can reproduce and make more lynxes. And it's closing this loop that is often a, a conceptually difficult thing to, to say or to, to figure out. Um, and we can look at this in terms of, you know, how does education affect crime? Or how does group morale affect our sales? Or how does group morale affect not just our sales, but our returns? And how does returns affect our group morale? 
And so we need to be able to open ourselves up conceptually to say, I'm going to map out, like I said a minute ago, all the nouns and how they interact and then look for the loops. And then once you've done that, then we can look for the primary loops. And typically what you'll find is there are numerous overlapping loops, but there's usually just one or two that form the backbone of any system that are the primary core loops in the system. And we'll talk more about that in our, in our boot camp, I'm sure. Exactly. All right. So if anybody here in our chat or on the YouTube channel listening in has a question, please type it in the chat and we would welcome to bring you on uh, to ask it directly if you'd like, or you can just type it into the chat. So uh, please ask us any questions you have. I've got a bunch if you don't, but I'm just going to take a moment and see if we have any questions. All right. So one question I see is, uh, what is the boot camp about? They, uh, so the summer innovation boot camp is our four week crash course in game thinking, which teaches you to innovate smarter and build engagement from the ground up. We have some amazing bonuses this summer, partly because some folks, amazing folks like Mike are available. Uh, one of them is our cooperative design mini course, which gives you five, you saw three ideas. It gives you five core ideas and teaches you how to apply those to build cooperative systems. The second bonus is a workshop on systems thinking. We, you got a little taste of it today. And Mike and I are co-teaching that. And we are preparing a system thinking fundamentals course to be available this fall widely to everybody. And we have a great passion for this, as we said at the very beginning of this stream, because we think there needs to be more systems thinking in the world to see through all the bullshit happening and really understand why things happen and how to collaborate for the good of everybody, not just be mad you can't get your hair cut or you have to wear a mask when you go into CVS. So that is uh, what's driving a lot of our passion is the timeliness of the urgent need for systems thinking. So this system, uh, system design workshop is a bonus that every boot camper gets. And if you can sign up for the boot camp, we welcome you. It's an amazing way to level up your skills and make it a really high progress summer. Okay, um, it looks like, how do you approach the beginning process? Andrew says, how do you approach the beginning process of identifying and participating in existing systems? How does that differ from creating a new system from whole cloth? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so the the identifying and articulating is is really Mike. I can't hear you real well. Did you? I'm sorry. No. I, put that sorry. a little. Just put your mic a little closer to your mouth. Uh, sorry about that. There uh, you go. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, identifying and articulating is exactly what what you're talking about here. Where you, um, like I said, there's a, there's this initial analysis, and often the easiest thing to do is to uh, look at the individual parts and say, what are the nouns here? You, typically, we can you can see those in in what's operating. Sometimes they're they're a little bit hidden. If you're doing a financial analysis, for example. Now, what I described a moment ago there was sort of very bottom up, saying looking at the looking for the nouns and the verbs. The other way to do this is to look top down and to say, okay, what's happening here? What's the experience? You know, the experience is the stock market is crashing, or the experience is our sales have dropped off a cliff. We don't know why. Um, and then you, you, you can go down in levels and say, well, what are the systems that we think are operating here and what's driving those? What are the, the parts in, that are, and their interactions that are creating the loops, that are creating the systems that are creating the overall experience, the overall whole? Um, so it's, it's not the kind of thing that I can really give a recipe for because every system and every situation is different. But in every system, there are the constants of the individual parts that you have and their interactions, how they affect others. And as I said a moment ago, in particular, if I can say, well, A affects B, I've got that, and B affects C, and then the, the aha moment often is, oh, and look, C affects A. 
Now I have a loop. Now I understand how they are. I can begin to understand how they affect each other. And even if that's not the only loop or even the primary loop, just finding one loop is sort of the, the, the thread you need to pull on to find everything else. Now, go ahead, Amy, sorry. I was just gonna jump in and say, this is such a great question because when you're learning system design or really anything that involves systems, there's two really different things. One is, hey, I want to build my own. Another is, I want to analyze the existing ones out there. And there's a few really common mistakes people make. When they analyze existing systems, they often see a lot of complexity. Mm -hmm. And when you're building a new system, every system that works that's big and complex started as a simple system that worked. It doesn't start big and complex. It's really but key. It's true of communities too. Certainly, but really it's a it's a really common mistake. The other thing that I think that is really interesting, and I have to say, for me personally, frustrating. I've worked on this a lot, is that we, I think, just as humans, have a difficult time um, making the leap from here are the rules, of, here are the interactions, and here's the overall system. We want to be able to predict that, and it's often very, very difficult to do. Going back to the the flocking slide that Amy Joe showed earlier, if I tell you the three rules of flocking, that I don't. I have not yet met anyone who has been able to go. Oh, from that, I can deduce that a flock will appear. That just seems to be something that either we are not good at, or that it's just simply not predictable uh, from sort of first principles that way. And this holds true in system after system. So it can be difficult to reason from the rules you're seeing to a system. Uh, and we can get into ways of, of saying, well, you know, what if I tweak one of these rules a little bit? What if I say it's okay to run into each other? Does the flock still form? Oh, look, it doesn't. So, you know, different things happen. So that's part of the, the analysis and articulation uh, when you're trying to figure out what a system is. Uh, the other, right. Keep the going. Other, oh, the other part of that question about how does this differ from when you're trying to create a system from whole cloth? Um, this is really what, what game design is. And I think really it, it pulls out into product design overall. There, I typically recommend going top down, though again, top down and bottom up both apply, where you wanna say, what is the experience I'm trying to create? Uh, am I trying to create a, a um, you know, successful party or useful protest or just a really good product? And then it's a matter of saying, what are the systems I need to support that experience I'm trying to create? And what are the parts and their interactions with each other at the sort of the, the foundation of this that support these things? Um, this is not a one-time process. It's one that involves being able to go up and down in sort of your vision of the overall levels and many iterations to say, okay, I think we have that. Oh, now I understand this a little bit better. Let me, you know, you know, I got some difficult feedback from my users. Let me take that in and affect my systems or affect my, my, uh, my underlying parts. One of the things we, I'll often ask my students is, is this game providing the experience you want? And they never want to say, no, it's not, even when it's really obvious. And you have, to, you have to be able to step back and say, is this the experience I'm trying to create? If it is, great, reinforce it. If it's not, figure out how you need to change it. Exactly. So one of the ways in which we grapple with this question and answer it in our program is around learning how to build a compelling customer journey. We have this model we showed you earlier, Mike and I talked about it, the mastery path and learning loop model. That's a great model. Um, you can use it to build something, but you also can use it to analyze something. And in the summer boot camp, the main project that we give you is an analysis project. Now you can also do a build project during it if you're ripe and ready. It's an amazing way to make a lot of progress. But it's always good to start any project with market analysis. In gaming, we call it play the space. You, when you do uh, teardowns, the best game designers I know, they start, they say, oh, I have this great idea. They immediately play the closest competitors. They play the space, know what's out there, know where the holes are, just know what, what's happening in your space. So that's analysis in a sense. And we have something called the Mastery Path Teardown. That we, that we walk you through in the boot camp that lets you pick an existing product or game or service or marketplace, an experience that you're familiar with and analyze it using this, not just analyze what it looks like or onboarding, but analyze the experience over time. 
analyze the loop that pulls you back if there is one or note the lack of one. And I found and in working with high performing startup teams, this exercise where as a team, we play the space, analyze it and share our results in the mastery path format is absolutely transformational and regularly saves them months of time. Because when you do it and you put it into this format, which is absolutely systems design and systems thinking, because we ask you to analyze the core loop. Um, and that's, by the way, that core loop and stuff, we don't have time to get into it today, but we'll get very into it in the boot camp and in Mike's workshop. But that, um, you know, the question, I want to flip the question back and say, just say the role of analysis of existing systems is it's a great way to kick off any project. Know your market space. And it also is a great way to learn systems thinking as Mike teaches and as he's going to share with you in the workshop. It's also designing a system yourself. Small is beautiful. That's what MVPs are all about. And we could, we could go on about on and on about that. But again, you'll, if you want that, that's, the boot camp is for you. The, the art of understanding and visualizing and thinking about your customer journey, really giving it some thought, and then zooming in on a tiny MVP so you can get started and build a si simple system that works before the whole complex thing is so much the art of game design, but it's really the art of any great product team's design. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to comment on the start small. Uh, I, I will, again, tell my students that start small, and then my immediately I follow up with no smaller. Because the first thing you have in your think, oh, that's small. No, 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 smaller than that. Whatever it was you just thought of, cut it in half. Um, I think the, the other really important point there is that this is um, certainly great for game design, but I think for any product design. The way I got into game design, actually, was I was a, a user interface designer, and I was in charge of user-centered design for a medical device company. And uh, one of the very first, I won't tell the whole story here, it's a longer one, but, but I was given the, the task of figuring out why a product was not selling. And what I found out was I had to go out and do an analysis of the systems both within the product itself and how the product was used as part of user-centered design. And what I found out was this was a product that was targeted for physicians that was sold and placed in a way that was absolutely not going to work for physicians. And we ended up uh, taking about um, half or more of the of features out of the product and cutting its price way down and it sold like crazy. And that was a, a, a real big win for me and for validation of, of this early uh, exposure that I had to user-centered design. But it certainly works here now. We need to think about what is the system what are the systems going on inside that your users in their workplace within the product, how they, how they interact with the product. And you can approach that in creating a new system, but again, you've got to start small and say, what's the smallest thing I can do that will move me in the direction of better understanding what my users are trying to do or what this product needs to do? So we have some more questions coming in. Awesome. Uh, Scott asks, why do you say compete against the system? Isn't it better to say that the group is working toward a shared goal? which might be competing against an enemy, but might also be a purely positive goal. What's, what's the value of saying compete against the system? I think it's, a, it's an issue of clarity. Um, I can create a game. Can you, Mike, which, can you move oh, your mic just that. a little closer? And not, not sure why that's not working. Yeah, just push it a little closer. OK. Is that, there, is that that's better? so much better. OK, okay sorry about thanks. that. Um, I think I was saying is I think it's just a matter of clarity uh, in terms of the designer's mind where I can create a, a system where, you know, a game where we're all competing together to, to you know, create our small camp or something against a diffuse environment. But there are so many potential systems that are impinging on us there that just for clarity, it helps often to say, what is the one system that I'm operating against? It could be, you know, um, uh, it could be an, an, an evil enemy. It could be uh, economic collapse. It could be a, a pandemic. Uh, there is, in fact, a game called Pandemic, where as a, as a group, you, the, you as the players are are working against the system that is uh, trying to have this this pandemic spread. So it these are it's really just a difference in phrasing. Um, 
whenever you're trying to accomplish something, you are in at one level working against the system of entropy, the system of disorganization. You're trying to bring something new into existence that wasn't there before. And in a game sense, you often codify that to say, this is your enemy. Both it's, it's easier for the designers and it's easier for the players. Uh, but, but if you do that and there are multiple players involved, it's still a cooperative effort between the players. Um, again, just having that, that, that singular identified system often helps you then create the roles that you wanna have for the players and their social verbs, their social actions, so they can compete effectively together against this external system. Awesome. So just wanna acknowledge the folks that are here. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your question. We do have one more question from Scott, but. Wangar, Nihal, uh, Jaswinder, if you have any questions, type them in or you can say, I have a question and talk or share your video. We really would love to hear from you, even if you have a comment. Um, so the other question that we have right now is what are some of, let me just bring the chat back up. There we go. And what are some of the common barriers to systems thinking? that keep mm. us stuck in non-systems thinking? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think there's a couple of things I can point to. Um, on one hand, we often see the complexity in the world or we see the complexity in a, in a game or product and say, we just sort of throw up our hands and say, well, there's too much going on. There's no way to know what's happening. And frankly, I think we see a lot of this today with a lot of the misinformation that is swirling all around us. People just get fatigued by it and say, you know what? Who can say what's true? I'm going to believe what's comfortable for me. And unfortunately, that's how misinformation wins. So one part of this is sort of giving into the chaos, if you will. The other side of it is looking for root causes. This is a very common, I think, especially in, in Western thinking, where we want to find what is the cause. So if I say, if I, if I talk about the financial collapse in 2008, I can say, well, the cause was greed in bankers uh, going after mortgages. It's like, okay, at one level, fine, that works, but, but why were they greedy? What was happening? How were they incentivized? And what you find out is there's this entire financial ecosystem that includes everyone, including those people who are just trying to get mortgages for their homes, that becomes much more of a looping system. And it's not this single, single line, very linear way of looking at things. One of the reasons why this is so powerful is because all of our fiction, all of our uh, narratives are all linear. A happens and B happens and C happens, they live happily ever after, or C happens and then everything is terrible. But it's a line. It's a, and, we, and we love this idea of through lines. They're very easy for us to, to comprehend. So that's one of the things we have to break out of is this idea that everything is not chaos and everything is not linear, but there are these complex but analyzable systems in, in between. Awesome. So we are getting to the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining us. Are there any final questions from our group here? Andrew, it looks like you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Can you hear me? I Barely. do not hear anything, so perhaps I thought not. I heard Andrew say something. Oh, hi. Yeah, uh, I don't have anything to say uh, other than thank you. I love this, and uh, I think it's brilliant, and I definitely want to learn more. So uh, it's a question that's great. Well, check out there. our boot camp. Um, Scott, if you could put the URL in there one more time. Uh, but thank you for joining us, Andrew. How did you find out about it? You sent me an email. I did or Mike did? Uh, you did. Oh, awesome. That's great. That I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. So uh, this stuff has been transformational for me as a product designer. And I'm very passionate about bringing it in a um, digestible form. It, you know, Mike, I got to tell you guys something. <laughs> Mike has this amazing book. And by the way, we will send you, any of you who got an email from me, you'll also get a recording of this, a link to Mike's book. We're really into leveling you up, whether you sign up for the boot camp or not. But um, Mike teaches advanced system design. He works with game designers, you know, in university he, and trains them for jobs in industry. It's very advanced. But the basics of this, the stuff we talked about today, 
every product designer everywhere can benefit from. And a lot of us who came into product design, not through building systems, through web or, you know, business school or anything else like that, um, this can be very hard. But time after time after time, when I work with people and teach them, they blossom and it transforms them and they go on to be much more successful as product leaders. And I know Mike teaches product leaders and grooms the next generation. And so that's what we're doing here by collaborating, by sharing this with you today and by offering the boot camp and the um, systems thinking course. Keep your eye out for that. It'll be out in the fall. Um, we are uh, supporting what we think are really important uh, knowledge sources and transformational ways of looking at the world for you as product creators, but also just so that we can have the world that we want to live in. Yeah, thank you, Amy Jo. I think that that's exactly right. And and I, um, I, I thought Amy was going to say something a minute ago that she didn't. Uh, I, I, I hope that if you if you're interested that you'll take a look at the the book that I wrote. It is a game design book, but it is broadly applicable to to many of the things as we've been talking about here. Um, it is somewhat advanced, and so one of the things we're working on is to bring this uh, to people who are not necessarily ready to jump in with both feet into systems design and game design, and really highlight the core aspects of this. So that's one of the things that uh, that Amy, Joe, and I are collaborating on now. Yes. And many of my students have bought Mike's book and told me, thank you. And we'll make sure to provide a link for that as well. So thank you all. Just making sure there's no more questions. We are good. All right. Thank you all for being here, for listening. Thank you, Mike, so much thank for you your time. Um, this made me feel really connected for us to be here talking about this together. And it gives me hope that all of us will be able to bring our knowledge and our passion for cooperative systems into everything that we do. So Likewise. I hope Thank that's you. an inspiring message to take into your Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for being here. Really glad you enjoyed it.